questions about the homework, which is good because it means people are reading it. The uh, one question I got over the weekend was that table 29.9 in the new data sheet is, has been moved to table 30.10. So, however, um, if you just go with the link that's actually in the homework, then the, the, the table mentioned in the homework is correct. I almost hesitate to even say something like this because it reminds me of the old joke uh, uh, about the ship. Uh, this, this crate has to be shipped upside down to avoid confusion. The top has been labeled bottom. <laughs> it's just better to say nothing. Right. Um, any other questions? Now, yeah, one question just came up. There's, uh, I said in the, in the homework to calculate R so that the number of ticks on the counter was between 160,000. That is the time to get to the threshold of 1.2 volts. So this time, this time that you're actually measuring that is going to determine the capacitance has to be between 160,000 counts. What else? Well, at some point, the maximum current for the sum of all pins. At some point, if you try, try and draw enough current from all the pins, the chip will melt. What is that current? It should be on the spec sheet somewhere. So the question is, what are the tolerances, tolerances of the resistors in the lab and how are we going to mitigate the effects? Number one, your, the re ohmmeters are good to about 1%. You should measure your resistor that you're going to use. See if it really is what's specified on the color bands. Number two, the TAs are going to carry around a carefully calibrated set of capacitors that they've that they've chosen for values around 1 nanofarad, around 10 nanofarads and around 90 or 100 nanofarads. So about one every decade. So they'll test something like three or four capacitors against your circuit and there and the value should come out within 5% of what they know the value to be. What else? Yes, yes, so you want to choose a resistor so that any value of C gives you a count between 160,000 okay. without changing the resistor. But if you did want to change the resistor, how would you do that? Well, instead of hooking it to VDD, remember the resistor on this circuit is hooked to VDD, but if you just hooked it to a port pin instead, you could switch it on and off. And then you could have two resistors in parallel on different port pins. But that would give you auto ranging. But don't do that. Just pick one resistor such that for a given prescaler, you can get a range of counts between 160,000.
Uh huh. You don't. Okay, on table 29.9, they, they list several VI pairs. And so, the question is going to be, which one should you choose? Why not choose them all and do a straight line fit? Okay. Or, do some reasoning and say, if, if, the, if the system is nonlinear, which it undoubtedly is, what value makes the most sense to use? Talk about it. Don't assume that the TA agrees with you. Just state your reasoning. Uh huh. That's what you. I want is the time. Yeah, the, the, the question is, uh, is uh, ask us about the discharge time, but in step two uh, on the uh, lab lab information, it says charge to uh, the step two is uh, processing charging. Charge to zero. Did I? Is there a typo? You're saying? Yeah. Send me the typo. I'll fix it. Wait, 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 now. Do, how to use the regular, because normally you just use a function generator and an oscilloscope for comparators. So, a comparator is just comparing two voltages. You have one here that you're going to set to one. You're talking about calibrating the source, right? And so here, you have to put some voltage on. You could put a triangle wave on here. Certainly could. Put a triangle wave on the input. And what's going to come out of the output? Square wave. And let's say that's 1.2 volts. So the square wave is going to look like that. So you could then take the cursors on the oscilloscope, freeze this, put a cursor right here, and measure the voltage on the top, on the top trace. That would be a good way to do it using the signal generator. Go ahead. Oh, very interesting. So the so you so yes, the ADC does use a reference voltage, but not necessarily this reference voltage. It can use VDD. Now the question is does this co-vary with VDD? And I don't believe so. I believe this is a band gap reference. So then you have to ask which is more accurate, VDD or the band gap? So how accurate is a, a typical voltage regulator? I actually put the part number of the voltage regulator on the data on the uh, lab write up so you could look it up, although I hadn't intended that. And they're usually about 5%, maybe a little better. So it's not clear whether you could do that or not, whether the ADC would, be, would give you an accurate enough reading. It depends on, on exactly how AREF is derived from VDD. Mm -hmm. sure. um, just, uh, I think the, uh, I have checked the uh, user manual. It says 
says that the uh, uh, reference word is generated by a letter structure, and that may cause some uh, error about the voltage. And uh, it is, I think, it's also a letter, it could be a letter structure, and it could have uh, error. So if we also use this structure, the ABC will also uh, cause error. So we if it's if it's a ladder if it's a if it's a divider off of VDD, then you're out of luck. Then you have to measure it externally. Anybody have trouble with video note over the weekend? Yeah, it was broken. They had a bad file name on the uh, videos. It's now fixed. <coughs> Another question that came up over the weekend is, which variety of PLIB to download? And if you're going to download PLIB, you should use the legacy version, not the Harmacy, Harmacy, Harmony version. Legacy version, not Harmony. The Harmony version is a work in progress. Don't use it. You will find, though, that since the default for this compiler is the Harmony library, that the if you use plib, I love it. I, I can reuse this stuff without even redrawing it. plib.h is the legacy library, and as a result, the compiler will throw about eight million deprecation uh, warnings. Have you noticed that? Have you tried it yet? Have you tried compiling anything? Anybody tried compiling? Yeah? Did it work? Uh, yeah, I got a bunch of yeah. So what you have to do is, every time you include plib.h, just before you do that, do a pound define underscore sub press s u p p all caps all caps folks s u p p r e s s underscore p lib underscore warning and it seems necessary to define this as unity i'm not sure that's true but i think it is That should turn off all the annoying excess warnings. More questions? In the last lecture, there were two separate frequencies. There was a CPU frequency of 64 megahertz and a peripheral bus frequency of 32 megahertz. Which are you talking about? CPU is running at 64. Does not have to run at 64. I set the PB clock to divide by 2 from the CPU frequency. You can set it to whatever you like. However, if you do that, you may have to correct the timing in uh, correct the timing in uh, proto threads. Because I think I did something stupid and hard coded the peripheral bus rate. I'll have to check that.
All right. So the next topic is proto threads. This is a lightweight threader. It is non preemptive, it is cooperative, which means that a thread has to explicitly yield to the threader. A, a thread that's executing must yield the CPU for the, for the threader to take over. There is one stack for all threads, so you have to be a little careful about variables. You can't define a variable on the stack for a, for a thread because there is no unique stack for the thread. On the other hand, it's a very fast context switch. But because it is not a real-time operating system, because it is not a real-time kernel, you can't guarantee any sort of response time on any thread. Therefore, if you have a time-sensitive process, where time-sensitive means that it has to be microsecond accurate with low jitter, then or anything less than a millisecond, really, anything less than a millisecond uh, time accuracy, you should use an interrupt service routine. But for timing 200 milliseconds for updating the LCD, do you care if there's a millisecond of jitter? No. I don't even think the most precise of you can detect a millisecond of jitter. Can anybody? There's usually one mutant who can. <laughs> People are not standardized. People have a range, huge range of abilities in any parameter you could think of. Now, uh, so, so for lab one, I don't think you need anything better than a millisecond. You might not have to write an interrupt service routine at all. There is one running for you on your behalf. There's a timer interrupt service routine running that maintains the millisecond counter that is used by proto threads to dispatch functions. Let's go back and look at this example, the one we started on last time. Oh, good. Ah, yes, because I have to hit the right button. And I think last time we talked about the uh, setting up the clock, the fact that the system frequency is running at 64 megahertz, which is a little hotter than, than the specified uh, level at which you're supposed to run the CPU, but it seems to work fine. We have to include a pt underscore cornell dot h because I made some extensions which you can read about on the pro. How do you want to start on this? Do you want to start with code and look at specifics or do you want to start with a table of commands? Code. Code. Code usually constrains the commands better than a list constrains the commands. We have to produce some control structures here. There's a, there's a set of structures uh, called uh, PTSM uh, for semaphore. I'm going to define three semaphores. One to control thread one, one to control thread two, and one to, to control printing to the UART. The reason for doing this is that there's only one UART and if two threads try and print at the same time something bad will happen. The, it'll be some buffers will be corrupted. So whenever you, whenever you use the single communication port, you have to lock it with a semaphore. Then each thread that you're going to define, each different thread, has to have a structure. There are five 
threads that I've written in this example, all rather short and trivial, plus an input thread, an output thread, and a direct memory access output thread, which are part of the extensions I wrote for proto threads and not something you would write yourself. The <clears throat> advantage of using these is that when you ask for input from the terminal, which can take arbitrarily long, let's say that the user has gone out to lunch, can take arbitrarily long. If you use scanf, it freezes the system because this is non-preemptive non uh, threader. It freezes the system, nothing else can execute. If you use this input device, this input uh, thread that I wrote, then the threader changes context on every character. You type a character, it hops back to this thread, adds that character to the string, it drops back to another thread. So it allows other threads to execute. Likewise on output, this output thread allows other threads to execute in the millisecond it takes to send one character via the serial port. If you use the DMA output, the then other threads can execute until the null character is reached at the end of the string which is being sent. And you got some, got some control stuff here for rates of execution, how long do we want thread one to wait, thread two to wait. And I wrote a little rate, a rate scheduler, but you don't have to use it. There's a, a, a a global which is uh, system time in seconds which I found useful for debugging. So the first thread then you declare by calling, uh, calling the system, uh, calling the macro PT thread you send it a uh, a function name and a argument list the only thing you absolutely have to send in is the structure for the point uh, for the thread itself. Then you have to mark where the thread begins. Then you drop into the usual never-ending while loop. You never exit a thread unless you exit using a PT exit. So, we're gonna, the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to wait on a semaphore. We're going to wait on a semaphore, control one, which is controlled by thread two. So the system just stops here until control one is true. Then it sets a debug value. Debugging a threader can be hard because you can't always tell the order in which threads execute. So, what this does, debug value does, is to use the internal voltage reference, not the 1.2 voltage reference, yet another voltage reference that outputs to pin 25. I think it's called CV ref. Outputs to pin 25. And this says put a 2 millisecond microsecond pulse on the debug pin with amplitude 3 and I think that's 125 millivolts per integer value so that's like 375 millivolts. By watching that pin with a scope you could tell which thread is executing. So it's a real-time debugger as long as you have an oscilloscope. So is anybody thinking, wait, there's a reference that has an external output? Why don't we just use that for the comparator? And you could. Then you could measure with a voltmeter. <clears throat> uh, 
Down in main, I've already set up port A to be an output, so I'm going to do an M port A toggle bits on bit 0. That's so I can tell that an LED is blinking. Then we're going to signal the semaphore to tell thread 2 to execute. So thread 2 and thread 1 are going to blink two LEDs out of phase because they're locked to the pair of semaphores. We're, we're allowing thread 3 to control the blinking also by, by seeing if this random variable control blink is true or not. So we're going to yield until that's true. And then, uh, then we do a PT yield time milliseconds for some wait time. This yield is not a blocking delay. It is not blocking. It yields to the threader which allows another thread to execute. So as long as there's another thread ready, it will execute. <coughs> then we mark the end of the thread with a PT end and we're done. Any questions on this? Is this too obscure? Makes sense? Yes. Just the, the yield and the last one. Um, the parameter you're giving it, wait, you want. Yeah, it's a time in milliseconds. Oh. before it executes, before it continues execution after this line. So when it hits this line, it'll set up a counter internally. It'll drop back to the threader, find out if something else can execute, and go off and do that for a while. Uh, what's the point of the PTN if it's like after the while? It is a syntactical requirement of the way these macros work. This, the, <clears throat> your whole program is operating as one linear program that's been written in a very twisted order using these macros. It's using a, a, a feature of C called, I think it's called Duff's device. Anybody know about Duff's device? This is obscure, folks. It is legal in C to jump into a to jump into a while loop using a go to oh my head hurts what does that mean that's legal and that's how this works second thread is uh, shorter it's doing a sem weight on control 2, which is being set by thread 1. It puts a different debug value out for a different number of milliseconds. It toggles another port pin to blink another LED. Remember that every LED has to have a resistor in series with it. 330 ohm resistor. We signal control 1 to, to, to allow thread 1 to execute again. And we're done. But yes? Waiting on a semaphore stops only execution of that thread. Is everything static because there's only one stack? Everything is static because there is only one stack. So if you want to declare a variable within a thread, I didn't actually put it within the thread here. But if you declare these within a thread, you have to declare them static. If they're on the stack, the default way to, to declare a variable in a, in a function is dynamic. And they will be wiped by the threader. Yes? Yes. What? Why, when you, the, so when you yield for a certain time, then you're guaranteed that for that much time, the current thread will not execute. But anything else can execute. 
After that time, this the current thread will execute when it gets a chance. It is not forced. There's no there's no preemption. If there, if there, if if something is global, it need not be static. It's static by definition if it's global. I think it was because I was playing with it at the time. I don't think there's any good reason. Remember, I've only been using this for a year. It takes me about five years to get good at one of these things. The serial interface then <clears throat> is just a big homely, uh, stupid parser. I was going to say but ugly, but that's a little uh, informal. Although it turns out that the word but hurt is now an official English word. <laughs> and who would like to define but hurt for me? Is this... You're, you're inappropriately upset about something, right? Then you're butt hurt. Right. That's, at least that's how I heard it defined, that it's an inappropriate degree of upsetness about... Jimmy, I actually introduced a slang term to you? That's, uh, no, it's impossible. I heard it on NPR, so it must be real. <clears throat> So the, the main interesting thing I want, want you to look at here is that if you want to avoid blocking when you're using serial terminal, you set up a print string, in this case a command prompt, and then you spawn a thread. So you're going to spawn a thread from the current thread to the target thread, and this is the name of the thread, P a PTDMA put serial buffer. It pops open a direct memory access channel and barfs memory out to the serial port in hardware with no other software interaction. When it hits the null at the end of the string, the DMA flag returns control to this thread again. In the meantime, any other thread can execute. So this blocks this thread until the output is done, but it does not block any other thread. <clears throat> then we uh, spawn an input process, input thread, and wait until enter is pushed by the oh-so-slow human. Then, then this thread dies, returns to the current thread, do a scan F, S scan F to do the conversion from to uh, whatever set of values, execute it and, and leave. The version that of PT threads, proto threads that you're going to use in lab one, does not include any serial capability because. I wanted to use the serial channel to control the TFT display. The TFT display gives you good debugging without the overhead of having to use the PC, the uh, uh, serial terminal on the PC to, to debug. So there's a slightly modified version of ProtoThreads which is on the TFT page, on the TFT uh, description. And that entire project with all of its dependencies has been zipped up for you on the TFT page. That's what you should use for start. <clears throat> Thread 4 just blinks. Boring. Thread 5. Thread 5 keeps the, millise keeps the one second timer. It does a yield time of 1,000 increments the sys time 
and die and, and, and stops again for another thousand milliseconds. It's pretty accurate. It's okay. Then we go into main and set up all of the horrible low level stuff, but not quite all of it, because a lot of the horrible low level stuff is in is in the pt.cornell.h file. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But we do a PT setup, which has all the horrible stuff in it. We initial, initialize uh, system uh, multi-vector interrupts. Set up a bunch of pins for digital I.O. Initialize the semaphores, one of them to zero and two of them to one. If both of these were initialized to zero, if control one and control two were both initialized to zero, we would have deadlock on the first two threads. Neither of them would ever execute. And for the third one, we start with ready to send because when you boot, you assume that the, the, tra the serial transmit is not busy. In it, all the threads. And there's two, po there's two possible schedulers here. This is the rate scheduler. But you can also just do round robin. You can you can call it scheduler. You can schedule one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Just go through them. As long as the system is not heavily loaded, this works fine. Let's just take a look at this. This, there's a bunch of macros in here, but but down towards the bottom of the file is where we set up the a lot of the internal stuff. CV, uh, <clears throat> so there's a, there, there is an interrupt running here. We, see, we write the interrupt as a void underscore underscore. That's two underscores. ISR, timer five vector. And there's a typo. That should be timer five. So if you write a timer two handler, you'll get, a, a re, you'll, you'll get an error because you've... you've Double to find that symbol. I'll fix that next time around. All that the interrupt service routine does is to clear the interrupt flag, which you have to do yourself, and then increment a millisecond tick and leave again. That interrupt service routine takes about uh, uh, 550 nanoseconds or so. <clears throat> We do a system config which messes with the internal state of the uh, hardware to, to optimize execution speed. Then we set up the USART I.O. pins using the peripheral pin select stuff that we talked about last time for UART2 receive and UART2 transmit pins. And that corresponds to pins 22 and 21. And it apparently the default printf goes to UART2. So that's why I used UART2. Then there's a whole bunch of stuff on, that sets up the UART. Config, enable, transmit, receive only, uh, status size, baud rate, all that stuff that you would have to set up for any uh, serial channel. And, <clears throat> but because I wanted to set this up for D, uh, DMA output, then I have to do a bunch of DMA setup stuff, which I don't want to talk about too much right now, but allows you to bypass the CPU for doing a data transfer. And if you go through all this, you'll, you'll, which we will go through in more detail later, we'll find that we're setting up a channel. When we trigger the first character send, 
in software. The rest of the character send will happen in hardware until we get to a pattern match of 0, 0, which is end of string in C. We've got to set up timer 5. There's a macro called open timer 5. We turn it on. We set the source to internal. That means the PB bus. We set the prescaler to 32. Since the, since the, since the peripheral bus is 32 megahertz, this is ticking at one microsecond per, per uh, tick. And so 999 gives you one millisecond. We configure interrupt for timer 5, the interrupt on, priority 2, clear the interrupt flag for obsessiveness sake, 0 the tick timer, and now that timer will just continue to tick forever. So what's the overflow time? Hmm, where does, the syst where does time tick? millisecond overflow. It overflows at 2 to the 32 milliseconds. So that's about 2, bi two to the 9th divided by 1,000 is 2 to the 6 mil 2 to the 6 seconds and since there's pi times 10 to the 6 pi times 10 to the 7 seconds in a year that would be a month or so. A good round number, pi times 10 to the 7 seconds in a year. Does that bother you? <clears throat> then we open the VREF, enable it, enable the output, set the range to low, set the source to VDD, and the value to zero. And after that, you can output one of 16 values onto the ref pin at at least 200 kilohertz. Which means you have 16 values that can be updated at 200 kilohertz. You have a DAC. It's a cheesy DAC. It's only four bits, but it's really fast. And it's really easy. So for lab three, we'll have you use that as a sound output. Oh yes, and once again, I write here that uh, initially I got CVRCON, that's a control register for the, uh, the, the uh, VREF as 8060 from Tamid's blog, um, which was extremely helpful in many ways. <clears throat> so, What other questions about homework are there? Generally, do you want us using like the PY macros, or can we write directly to registers? You can write directly to registers if you want. You can see, uh, so there's a set of 17 registers for every I/O port. Most of them you don't have to mess with. You have to mess with at least three. The input port, the output port, and the TRIS, I guess it is, tri-state buffer. And uh, if, you're, if you like PIC and you're, and you're into that, have at it. I prefer to use the slightly more descriptive macros, but it's up to you. Or write your own. But if you do that, document it sufficiently so the TAs can figure out what you did. What else? When you get to lab this week, we will give each, we will loan each group a CPU, a TFT display, and a keypad and a whiteboard. You're going to have to immediately, before you can do anything, somebody in the group is going to have to solder the header to the TFT display because I didn't feel like soldering 45 of them. So you have to solder the header on there 
Make sure you don't put it on upside down, folks, because it's really hard to read the display from under the table. If you put it on upside down, then you'll spend another hour taking it off and putting it on right side up. So think a little bit before you put that header on. Ask a TA. Ask me. What other questions about homework one? Can you take the boards home? We're going to give you a box to put this stuff in as long as you're carrying it in the ESD box. So as long as you put the whiteboard with all the components in the ESD box, you can slap it into your pack and carry it home. At the end of the semester, I expect to get back one of each from each group working. As long as that's the case, you can take it home with you. Yeah, you can work at home. I'm not going to allow you to take an oscilloscope home. I'm not <laughs> or, or, or a signal generator or many of the other components in the lab. But, but you probably, well, for lab one, all you need is a resistor and a capacitor, right? I'll, you, that you can take home. So, yeah, you can plow away on your laptop all you want. I will also have the lab open as much as physically possible. Not this week, not today, not tomorrow, but next Monday and Tuesday, I'll have it open in the morning for those of you who want to work. We cannot be in there Tuesday, Monday and Tuesday afternoon because 2300 is in there. And they rightfully get annoyed when we take over the class. So... But the rest, most of the rest of the week, the lab will be open. You're welcome to come in any time there's a scheduled lab. Clearly, the people who are in the lab get first shot at the work area, but there's a limit on 28 people in the lab, and there are, are stations for 42 people. Now, if there's 42 people in the lab, it gets hard to breathe, but there's a place for everybody to sit. Any more questions about? Yes. Uh, for the proto thread library and the lab, are we constrained to the 32 megahertz for bus spotting 64 uh, megahertz? No, you can change it to whatever you want. The only thing you have to change to make everything work is if you decide to change the rate away from 32 megahertz, then where you set up the timer where you set up this timer you have to make sure that this timer times out once per millisecond you set this to 16 make that 2000 you change it to a 1 megahertz clock for whatever reason make this 1 or make that 1 so as long as this timer times out every millisecond, everything is good. Yes, I should have parameterized it. I didn't. I will. But, but not before lab one. What else? Okay, let's talk about final projects for two minutes. It's a recurring theme here. Final projects. Who's got an idea for final projects? Yes? Michaela? Yeah? Um, something that steers music and then writes the sheet music. Ooh, listens to music and writes sheet music. That's hard but very interesting. I think if you're going to do that, you ought to constrain it to a fairly simple source. Maybe, uh, maybe a, a keyboard or something that you can put a microphone close to uh, because you, 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 want a, you want a well defined harmonic structure. But yeah, that's quite an interesting project. That's, that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, gloves that recognize typing? Gloves that recognize typing. So, so getting which finger is, is, is down is easy. 
how do you determine which row of the keyboard you're in? Do you have like a flex sensor? Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. Okay. <laughs> so, are you... So you're going to get absolute position from the flex sensor for row. Yeah, it, it could work. I'm trying to think about... So you only need three rows total, right? You need full extension, moderate, and full flex. So you might have to do some funny motion like flex in like this and then hit the key like this. I think it's doable. So you're talking about 10 flex sensors and what else? The tap, right. So it could be a, a, a acceleration sensor on the... So you might run into just wiring problems because you have so many sensors. Or you could run into... Um, um, crosstalk. Hard to say on that one. That's, a, that's, that's tricky. I've seen a, various keyboards including one that used a sheet of infrared light that when you broke it with a finger, camera told you which button you were hitting. That was kind of outrageous. It worked. What else? <laughs> to use a technical term. <clears throat> Stuff, lots of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, sure. Heck yeah, yeah. Any any kind of synthesizer is uh, is is good. Uh, additive is interesting because of the flexibility, uh, and because it's fairly easy to get the the harmonic content of an instrument. Although the ratios of frequencies in any given instrument varies with time very quickly. So you have to figure out a way of getting some dynamics on each different harmonic. And I, I, I have some code that does that. And I think there's enough bandwidth on this CPU to do it very nicely. What else? Yes? I have seen videos. I'd love to test drive one, but no. Uh-huh. Okay. I was going to say, you're nuts if you put this in your car. Uh, even if it's perfectly safe, your, your insurance man isn't going to like this at all. The insurance guy is not going to like it. So, uh, so you're going to, so you, you need to think carefully about testing. And if you have RC cars, now you're talking two cars, right? Now you got to have a, a lead car and a follow car. Uh, yeah, servoing, servoing on a car is interesting. I want to think a little more about that one. Okay, let's. It's 13 after. Let's go, but keep up the thinking. I like the ideas. <laughs>